This is test footage for a color edition of the German newsreel reporting from the Eastern Front along the Oder River. In March 1945, news cameraman Gerhard Garms of the propaganda company films the Oder marshland. The Eastern Front runs straight across Germany through this area. For more than 10 days, in the southern part of the battlefield, bitter fights have been raging over Germany's eastern provinces along a new front line. The Oder River. Since January 22nd, the enemy has been trying to cross the river with massive forces and to expand the small bridgeheads they managed to establish in order to create a space for further troop deployment and a base for large-scale operations. The propaganda images conceal the fact that the Oder marshland has long become a blood-drenched battleground of the war. In two months, the German forces count 35,000 killed, wounded, or missing. After five and a half years of warfare, the Wehrmacht is bleeding to death. Young soldiers are supposed to hold the front. Artilleryman Hans Hansen was 17 years old at that time. At first, we threw ourselves to the ground. Whenever a shell exploded somewhere, no matter how far away, we would have liked to crawl into a mouse hole. But on the second day, we got used to it, and we were able to live with our own fear. Fear had become part of our daily life. The Oder River is no longer an obstacle for the Soviet army. They have established stable bridgeheads on the western bank, thus laying groundwork for a massive assault on Berlin. Two and a half million Soviet soldiers are deployed and divided into three army groups. The northern one is under the command of Marshal Konstantin Rokossovsky. The southern group is under the command of Marshal Konev. The main thrust is led by Marshal Georgi Zhukov with a force of 900,000 against 130,000 German troops of the 9th Army. Hitler orders the supreme commander of the army, General Theodor Busi, to hold the Oder Front at any cost. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels also puts pressure on Busi by announcing that Berlin would be defended at the Oder. The Reitwein Spur, a mountain ridge west of the Oder, is captured by the Russians in February 1945. Zhukov establishes his command post for the Great Offensive on top of the mountain. In front of him lay the battlefield of the Zelo Heights, and in the distance, the prize, Berlin. According to Stalin's orders, the offensive is to be launched by April 16th at the latest, and is to be concluded within 15 days, so the May 1st holiday could be celebrated in Berlin. Zhukov is Stalin's man for special assignments. Marshal Georgi Zhukov had been victorious in the battles of Moscow, Leningrad, and Stalingrad. He exudes an aura of invincibility. His army group alone has more than 3,000 tanks at its disposal, against 500 on the German side. With this enormous superiority, Zhukov is planning to crush the German defenses in one movement. At his Reitwein Spur command post, he prepares for the battle. Psychological warfare is handled by German soldiers in the Red Army, mostly by exiles like Stefan Dernberg, a native of Berlin. One of Marshal Zukov's lieutenant generals came to bring us his orders from the Reitwein command post telling us to make a PA announcement to the enemy that in a few hours the last great offensive of this war was going to be launched, and that troops and officers should offer no resistance and save their lives. I was always a bit undisciplined, even when I was young, and I dared to speak up. Comrade General, I said, that's how we address them in the Red Army. We can't possibly reveal a military secret telling them that we are going to launch the offensive. He replied, today you can, you have to. This is about saving the lives of both German and Russian soldiers. Rumors circulate on the German side about former Wehrmacht troops now under Soviet command 
led by German General Walter Zeidlitz, who had been captured in Stalingrad and was openly turned against Hitler. Gunter Dunsbach, who was at the Oder front as a 17-year-old, recalls how the Soviets used to make great promises. They promised to treat us well and give us food, but we saw this as a cheap propaganda trick. We were surprised, though, how well they spoke German on the other side. We were told that those were traitors and Seidlitz people who had joined the Russians and now fought against us. On the night of April 15, 1945, the German soldiers in the trenches at the Zelo Heights sent something big coming up. At three o'clock, German time, our artillery started to lay the groundwork. Well, it was more than that. It was an enormous creeping barrage going down on the German positions in the Oder Marshes. Anatoly Mareshko, an officer on Zhukov's staff, orders the attack. There are only a few troops in the most advanced German lines. They have to bear the full brunt of the assault. At the end of the trench, actually outside of it, was a foxhole. The lieutenant looked out of that hole with his binoculars. I sat further down and saw the first shot being fired, and he was gone, completely vanished. He had been hit by a high explosive projectile. Against this vastly superior assault force, the German units can only hope to delay the advance of the Soviets. But there is no way they can stop it. Senseless death and destruction is everywhere. There were twins, sons of an Air Force colonel, by the way. Very nice, affable guys. And one of them thought he had to shoot. He was instantly hit by a bullet in the head and dropped dead under the bottom of the trench. His twin brother bent over him, cried terribly because he had lost a part of himself. The Germans abandon one position after another and retreat. The remaining forces gather in stronger positions. They have all been through hell. And yet they are expected to continue fighting. The slopes and ditches of the Zelo Heights give the Germans an edge. Marshal Zhukov would later admit that he misjudged the treacherous territory. Our troops took the first lines and reached the Zelo Heights, but they were unable to capture them because the eastern slopes of this highland were very steep, covered with pockets of German resistance. So our infantry was stuck at the foot of the hills and under fire from the Germans. On the first day of battle at the Zelo Heights, Stalin calls Zhukov and puts pressure on him. If he does not break through to Berlin, his rival, Marshal Konev, is ready to do so. Zhukov throws another armored battalion into the battle. We used to call him the butcher, you know, because that's what he was like. He could kill a human being without twitching. Just like that, off he goes. Umar Birkhanov, who fought enemy tanks at the time, sees himself as a pawn in a deadly game played by the generals. These pictures show the planning of Operation Berlin.
Мы, мы ненавидели этих генералов, я до сих пор ненавижу. We hated those generals. I still hate them. Sending a soldier to his death was as easy for them as swatting a fly or squashing a bug. We soldiers were nothing but, what do you call that, cannon fodder to those generals. After three days, the Soviets managed to break through, but their losses are staggering. The battle for the Zelo Heights cost 33,000 Soviet lives and another 12,000 lives on the German side. On April 20th, the outcome of the battle has been decided. The Oder Line is lost for the Germans. Zhukov's army meets up with Marshal Konyev's troops approaching from the south. The 9th German army is surrounded. In the Lower Spree Forest, southeast of Berlin, 200,000 German troops are trapped in what came to be called the Halba Pocket. One of these men is Hans Hansen. The next few days were very tough. The Russians kept squeezing our pocket, fired artillery rounds, attacked us from the air. There was only one thing on our mind when we had a little break in between. How are we going to get out of here? Will we ever get out at all? The Red Army keeps firing relentlessly into the woods where the German units are huddled. They don't expect any organized form of resistance. They expect total annihilation. In the Halba Forest, A soldier writes in his diary. It is a losing fight, and we endure whatever comes our way. One direct hit, and you may hear many of the comrades scream and moan. They lie on the ground, and the tanks just roll over them. In the thin timber forest, the German troops are an easy target. Weilenstein's camp. The forest was full of vehicles and various groups of soldiers. It was a totally disorganized, chaotic jumble of equipment and wounded, as well as dispersed soldiers. Along with the soldiers, there are also civilians trapped in the Halpa forest. Most of the civilians are from further east and have sought shelter here. Now, the front has caught up with them. They all have one goal in mind, to break through Soviet lines and escape to the West. General Theodor Busi is still in charge, but he hardly has the situation under control. He orders a breakout, but most people try it on their own. Busi knows that his order means certain death for thousands. His troops are driven by the fear of falling into enemy hands. It was our turn now. In this thin timber forest, we charged forward right into their machine gun fire because we had no other choice. There was a village in front of us, a town, most of which was on fire. When we got closer, I could make out the name Halbe on the sign at the train station. I had never heard that name before, probably none of us had, but on those who were with us that day, it left an indelible imprint in their memory. Nearly 25 miles further to the north of the Halba Forest, Soviet troops reached the suburbs of Berlin. According to Hitler, on April 25th, the situation will improve. The Ninth Army will come to rescue Berlin. That same day, a soldier in the Halba Forest describes the true condition of the Ninth Army in his diary. The comrades gave all they had, but they were exhausted, and our lines just collapsed. 
We got some help when a group of German tanks came from the rear to give us support. The tank tracks just rolled over the dead and wounded soldiers. These images were so horrific that I cannot forget them, even after 60 years. But at least with the aid of those tanks, we managed to break out of the pocket. Hans Hansen is one of only a few thousand who escaped. Others keep wandering aimlessly through the woods. For them, it becomes a death trap. During a lull in the fighting, an unknown soldier notes in his diary. They always told us that the final hours of this war would be the worst, and they are. Why don't they stop? Why does nobody feel called upon to put an end to this fighting? Why does everything have to be destroyed first? Is it necessary that absolutely everyone writhes in his own blood, full of pain, before it ends? The author of these lines would not survive the Battle of Halba. And then fällt mir ein, der Spruch von and then, I remember something that Keita Kolwitz said in World War I. The seeds must not be ground up. This is the crime that our government, the Nazi regime, committed on its own people. Anatoly Bogachkin, 17 years old at the time, remembers Halba in a different way. The Germans were crossing the forest here with vehicles and even artillery. Our own artillery and infantry shot at the first vehicles to keep them from moving any further because there were trees all around. So they abandoned their vehicles and took only their weapons. We shouted, hands up. They put their arms up and came towards us. But when they were a few steps away, they started to shoot again. We quickly put an end to this game, and we killed many German soldiers and officers. Only then did more and more of them surrender, threw their weapons down and put their hands up. There was a clearing in the forest where we gathered them, lined them up, and marched them off to Siberia. We picked a German NCO, strong and red-haired, and put him in charge of the prisoners. He himself said, to Russia. To Siberia, march. Many still believe that the Russians are only plotting their revenge and have not taken any prisoners. In this war, shootings have been common on both sides. Sergei Kotkov, a tank driver at the time, knows where the fears come from. To be honest, I once witnessed an execution. I saw an SS man being shot, also a Ukrainian. The Ukrainian had been a tank soldier with the Germans, and this boy was so beautiful, more beautiful than any woman. The battalion commander went to him and insulted him. How come you were with the Germans? Why did you sell yourself? He pulled his gun, pointed it at the guy's forehead, and pulled the trigger. There was a hole in the forehead. He dropped. Soviet cameramen filmed these images, showing the remainder of the 9th Army near Halba. Nearly 120,000 Germans survived the battle as POWs. Most of them disappear in Soviet camps for years.
Outside of Moscow, we also captured a lot of Germans. They were proud and arrogant and showed off their alleged superiority. There were captured officers who are supposed to have said, you Russian pigs, you are going to be destroyed anyway. When the ring around Berlin closes, there is only one goal for what is left of the Ninth Army, linking up with the 12th Army under General Walter Wenck. These troops have stopped engaging U.S. forces on the Elba River and are now attacking the Soviets. Wenck's army has just been formed out of mostly young soldiers, and their original mission has been to stop the Americans at the Elba. But then, Hitler orders Wenck to come to the aid of the collapsing German lines at the Eastern Front. Peter Rettisch is the battalion commander of the 12th Army. The mission of Wenck's army was clear, to relieve Berlin. This is what the Wehrmacht's supreme command, in fact, Hitler himself, had painted as the great glimmer of hope. And that was General Wenck's mission. And at first, that's exactly what he set out to do. In Berlin, the Soviets have already captured the first suburbs. But German propaganda announces that Wenck's army is already on the way to turn the situation around. All I know is that Hitler was hoping for Wenck's army to get him out of there. And Keitel had told Wenck, you have to get the Führer out. And Wenck replied, I'll do what I can. And then Keitel went on to some of the subordinate troops, so we had to tell those people, don't listen to Keitel, only Wenck's orders are to be followed around here. After the war, Wenck writes, In these hours, I realized that Keitel and Hitler had been out of touch with the realities of the war for a long time. There was no way for us to liberate Berlin, but we could help a great number of people with a determined attack by opening up a route to the west. It was by no means impossible that we might also get the 9th Army out in the course of this operation. On April 26th, the last German offensive of World War II is launched. The direction of the thrust is Potsdam and Berlin. The advance proceeds well. The Soviets have been taken by surprise. During the advance, Wenck's army manages to recapture numerous villages. The fighting involves heavy casualties. For days, every single block was fought over in stubborn house-to-house -house combat. This was some of the toughest fighting I had ever been involved in. We were now in the fourth day of struggling over small patches of debris with alternating success. Control of the houses switched back and forth three or four times between us and the Russians. Thrown out, back in. It was very, very heavy fighting. And we also had our wounded in one of the houses. Before we could transport them back to the field dressing station, which eventually fell into Russian hands, when we recaptured it, the Russians had shot all our wounded. German newsreels keep showing these scenes from a recaptured village over and over again. We saw pictures of sheer horror. The women, the mutilated bodies, everybody was deeply moved by that. The Russian conquerors are supposed to spare the civilian population, according to the instructions they are given before the Oder Offensive. According to the order, the Germans are to be won over for the Soviet cause. But the message apparently has not trickled down through the ranks. Tank gunner Umar Birkinov tells the story. I was 21, no, 22, and he was 40. We considered him an old guy. And one day this man brought a German woman in at gunpoint, a real lady. I asked him, why did you bring this lady? He said, I'm going to take her now. 
I said to him, listen, you're an old man and she is so young and beautiful. Maybe she's an actress. So what? He replied, does that mean I can't take her? I said, please, let her go. You're not only old, you're also ugly. You think you're good looking? Take a look at yourself. <laughs> You have red hair, and you look like a pig. <laughs> then he complained. The officers can, but the rank and file can't. I said to him, go find yourself an old woman, but leave this one alone. And she was standing there, tears running down her cheek. I felt sorry for her. Umar Birkenhoff takes the woman to a safe place. She would not be harmed. In April of 1945, Gerda Varden, then 17, noted the mood in her hometown of Baylitz, a town right outside of Berlin. Many people were afraid of rapes. So many families in Baylitz committed suicide, poisoned themselves. Our pharmacist offered poison to people that he trusted. Many bought it. And many actually took it. That's how my own best friend died, too. Baylitz falls into Soviet hands without a fight. When the conquerors march through town, the streets are empty. The citizens, scared to death, take shelter in their basements. For Margarita Tirolt, suicide is not an option. We were so young at the time. We had not finished with life. When you are 20, you don't think about dying. The Red Cross aide witnesses the occupation of her hometown, Baylitz, and hopes to be spared the worst. First, my father was dragged out of the basement. We thought they were going to shoot him because we heard a shot. Then the door of the cellar swung open again, and the Russian, a Mongol, grabbed me and took me upstairs. The stairs went like this, and this, and when we were here, I told him, if you're going to shoot me, do it here. He said, no shooting, no shooting. And then he took me upstairs. Three hours that I won't forget as long as I live. When Venk's army reaches Baylitz, heavy fighting with Soviet forces erupts in the subterranean supply and maintenance tunnels. The Baylitz sanitarium, is the location of a very special episode in this final phase of the war. 3,000 German wounded are lying here in an army hospital. Vasily Demenchev, tank gunner in the Red Army, witnesses Venk's dogged fight for the sanitarium. The goal is to free the wounded. The operation is successful, but the losses are staggering. I told you about Baylitz. I remember it well. Because we had tough battles with the enemy several times a day, up to the 29th of April. We beat off one attack. It was quiet for three or four hours and then the next attack by the Germans followed. The fighting was extremely tough. Many people died, and many tanks, and vehicles, and guns were destroyed. But on the whole, compared to what the enemy suffered, 
Our losses were much, much smaller. On April 27th, Keitel writes to Wenck. The Battle of Berlin has reached its climax. The Fuhrer expects the armies to do their duty. History and the German people will have nothing but contempt for anyone who does not give all that he has to give. Wenck has plans of his own. He intends to return to the Elba River and surrender his troops to the Americans. But first, he wants to scoop up the remainder of the Ninth Army, the few troops that had survived the Battle of Halba. He has no intention of sacrificing his men to Hitler's lost cause. As a young soldier, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, who later becomes Germany's Vice Chancellor, serves under Wenck. General Wenck came with a General Wenck came in a motorbike with a sidecar and got out and addressed his troops. Comrades, I am asking you to hold out for another three days. The Ninth Army is coming from Frankfurt on the Oder with many wounded nurses and messengers. They are not supposed to fall into Russian hands. I promise you, I will lead you together with the Ninth Army into American custody. That was something very impressive for me, that he explained to us how and why, and that he wanted to lead us to the West. After all, Hitler was still alive at that time and had called upon Wenck's army to break through the Berlin Ring. But Wenck's priority was his responsibility for his own troops and he did not want to sacrifice the 12th and 9th Army as well. Dispersed units from the 9th Army are still trying to make their way through Soviet-occupied territory to reach the West. On April 30th, Venk radios to them. Hurry up, we are waiting for you. They march day and night, always on the run. The Red Army chases them, relentlessly. At one point, I was so exhausted, both mentally and physically, that I thought I couldn't make it. I got into a foxhole and wanted to stay there. I didn't want to go on, and I couldn't. I said to myself, you're going to stay here until the Russians come and get you out. But that lasted only a few minutes until I realized that's not what I really want. I cannot just lie down and await my destiny. The burden of military discipline is thrown overboard. All that matters now is saving one's own life. On May 1, 1945, on this field near Baylitz, the first major group of refugees, along with thousands of soldiers, meet up with Wenck's army. I will never forget these images, how soldiers with severe injuries were transported, sometimes in barrows, pulled by their comrades and there were many other wounded on crutches or being carried on stretchers. In between were nurses and messengers and soldiers, the picture of an army that had been through a horrible experience, a picture that left an indelible impression on me and showed once more how senseless war was. Wenck's army takes in 20,000 troops from the 9th Army and turns around, heading for the Elba River. Wenck plans to surrender to the Americans. He sends an emissary to the other side of the river, General Maximilian Reichsfreiherr von Edelsheim. At the Stendal City Hall, he is to offer the Americans the surrender of the 12th Army. U.S. General Moore tries to explain to Edelsheim that the Soviets are their allies and that the Americans already have more POWs than they can handle. However, he generously promises to let German soldiers cross the river to surrender to his troops.
100,000 German troops crossed the Tangamunda Bridge, the main bridge across the Elba, to meet their destiny. The Elba River symbolizes the thin line between a Soviet gulag and a U.S. POW camp, where they hope for better treatment. Peter Rettich wraps his diary in a condom, hides it in his canteen, and thus smuggles this important record of events through all the American checkpoints. One of his last entries is, The war is over. Prisoner. I have to relish even this bitter feeling. The emotions in my heart are indescribable. A U.S. infantryman poses in front of the Tangamunda Bridge. He is Chester Twentyman from Virginia. They came across with whatever equipment they had with them, bazookas and other small uh, weapons, and we advised them, or I advised them, to uh, tell their men to uh, throw the weapons into the river and, and cross on the, the bridge, which was broken down. They had to be careful when they crossed. The German army gives itself up. But this is not how the Soviet army imagines the end of the battle. When the Russians came over and discovered that the Germans were surrendering, and crossing the river, why then they uh, strafed the battalion, what is left of them there, and, uh, and a number of them were seriously wounded, and there may have been some that were killed. The Tangamunda Bridge is an easy target for the Soviets. but nothing can stop the fleeing Germans. There are even rumors that the U.S. Army has been waiting for the Germans to join them in their fight against the Russians. The situation on the Elba was absurd in the way that our artillery was firing at the Russians. And the Americans? Standing on the western bank of the Elba, only a few hundred meters away, watched us and had no intention of interfering. That gave us hope that we might reach some kind of understanding with the Americans. But of course, that was a utopian idea. The illusion is quickly shattered. Nobody wants to side with the Germans. But most of the troops who cross here are themselves victims of pointless orders to hold out. I arrived just before the bridge was closed. There were about 10,000 soldiers left, including many women who had dressed up in army fatigues and put on a helmet, because it had been reported originally that only soldiers would be accepted as POWs. Behind us was the Red Army, firing into the waiting lines with mortars. On the opposite bank were medics, doctors and nurses, Americans and Germans all mixed up. And the wounded were triaged immediately, treated and taken away. You might say that we all had a free choice at the time. Either cross and become prisoners of the Americans, 
or stay and become prisoners of the Soviets. That was one of the easiest decisions in our lives. The U.S. Army does not want to take any responsibility for the civilians crossing the bridge. Many are sent back to their homes, somewhere between the Elba and the Oder rivers, now in Soviet-occupied territory, and into an uncertain future. Soldiers like Hans Hansen become prisoners of the Americans, hopeful about their own future. Ever since, the 6th of May has become my second birthday. After all that had happened, I was able to start a new life. We had survived, and we were getting out. We did not mind getting out as prisoners, as long as we got out alive. Once more, there was a future in store for us. The forest near Halba, six decades after the battle. 60,000 German soldiers reportedly died on this battlefield. Only 26,000 have received a proper funeral so far. Mortal remains are still found today. Erwin Kovaika has been working for 10 years transferring the dead on behalf of the German War Graves Commission. During this period, he has recovered the remains of 8,000 soldiers in Brandenburg. This is his ID. That is the direction they broke out of the pocket. Many made it only halfway and were left here. These are the ones we find here. I guess between 30 and 35. The bones tell the age of the deceased. The dog tag reveals his identity. His name is known, and his next of kin will know now where to find his grave.